Welcome back, folks, to the Shifting Schools podcast. It is such a joy to bring you today's conversation. We talk about the power of gaming for building belonging, and we also talk about um, perhaps what questions school leaders should be asking themselves about why they need to see gaming in a new way. Our amazing guest for you today is Dr. Kristen Kraft, who has served as a teacher, principal, and district administrator in public education for the past 27 years. She's a champion of students that really comes through in today's discussion. Dr. Kraft is currently the Scholastic Esports Specialist for Generation Esports. She helps normalize esports in education by supporting schools and districts to create a Scholastic Esports pipeline. She mentors educational leaders, helps teach aspiring principals at the university level, and presents at multiple conferences. You're going to be able to head over to the show notes and learn all about ways that you can connect with Dr. Kristen Kraft. And I'll also mention that she is the Gaming Concepts podcast host and has been featured in several educational leadership podcasts and publications. In 2021, Kristen was also named the Kansas Principal of the Year. Dr. Kraft, I would love to start our conversation uh, actually quoting you back to you. And this comes from your Gaming Concepts blog where you wrote, quote, Gaming Concepts provides a unique platform for promoting positive mental well-being with embedded mental health moments throughout the lessons. Students experience a sense of belonging, teamwork, and camaraderie. They develop essential social and emotional skills, fostering resilience and reducing stress, end quote. I'm wondering if you can talk to us a little bit more about the social and emotional skills you see students cultivate through gaming. Um, yeah, I love, you know, I think the best thing about, uh, you know, uh, esports that is a huge misconception in schools is that it actually is promoting um, a positive mental health and it is developing those skills that we always talk about in schools that we want to, to see. So for example, um, you know, communication, you know, that's a top employability skill. Um, when you are playing video games, and I want to kind of start by saying too, that think of video games as something that um, describes purposeful play. Uh, when we often think of video games, I think we think of screen time. And it's very different. Screen time is really what leads to a lot of that um, uh, depression, anxiety, uh, because we're comparing ourselves on all of the wonderful, you know, tools on social media and things like that. But when you think about purposeful play and, and really developing skills among kids, you know, they have to be able to communicate effectively when they're playing, especially when they're on a team situation. Um, they have to be collaborating, collaborative. Um, they have to um, stay calm. You know, whenever we're playing games, uh, we get angry. We get angry when somebody says something to us. And so um, part of that learning experience is learning, well, what, what is anger? And how do we, how do we, why do we get a physiological change in our body, say, when we have somebody say something to us while we're gaming? And that's because we have fight or flight systems. And so when you start kind of taking it from the what we do with gaming concepts is we take it from the interest level of kids being involved in video games and saying, okay, now let's apply that to life. And they're much more communicative and talkative. And um, because we have a journaling and like reflective aspect, you know, we know change behavior only happens when you've been reflective in that change of behavior. Um, and so we've just seen a lot of success with kids getting better at those essential skills. You know, they're, they're finding their friend group. Uh, when they uh, are playing games at school. Lots of times, I know my kid, for example, um, it plays in, you know, we always think of the gamer in the basement with no friends. And they're they're playing with other kids probably from who knows where. Uh, when you bring it into the school, now they find their peer group. Now they're playing against kids they know. 
Um, they might even be, you might even have a situation of um, a, a kid that's very, um, say, invisible to the school, but the captain of the football team is in the same team and now they have a friendship. So you're crossing a lot of, you know, lines of what we might see as kids who would normally communicate or, or build that connection. And that's exactly what we want in our schools is connection and um, and giving kids that opportunity. So I could talk forever. So I'm going to stop talking. I hope that answers your question on that. But the skills are endless. Um, they're just endless. And I could listen to you forever because I think what you're talking about is almost like a right to rehearse right? You know, if we want mm -hmm. students to be capable of doing that emotional uh, moderation, as you said, kind of like experiencing anger and knowing how to communicate that effectively, knowing how to reflect on that, knowing how to continue collaborating even in that state, that's a life skill. You know, I, I feel like employability, yes, but this is also so important for our yes. friends and family. So, yes, um, you know, and, and I really love you speaking to how many different opportunities does your school provide for that student to feel like they are contributing to the community, mm -hmm. right? And mm -hmm. this is another great way for them to do that. Um, Dr. Kraft, you, of course, congratulations again as 2021 <laughs> Kansas Principal of the Year. You're kind of perfectly positioned to be talking more about, um, you know, how esports can help a school rethink, reimagine their SEL program. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering... Again, as a leader, what do you wish more of your fellow school leaders were thinking about when they think about this intersection of gaming and SEL? Yes, that is such a great question because I have been a part of, you know, being a building leader for 20 years. And, and I think we have missed the boat as far as how we have done social emotional learning. I think it's important. I think we should have it, but has it been effective? And I think we can at, we can actually say, no, it hasn't been effective because we know in 2021, you know, after the pandemic hit that the Surgeon General said we need a swift coordinated response to mental health, which is a basically that social emotional piece. Um, and so what we've done for years is we've had uh, homeroom time and we've we've spent thousands of dollars on programs where we say, okay, today's lesson this week is going to be on perseverance. So if you guys, the teachers, if you would go ahead and play this video, here's some questions to have for a discussion. And that's, we then we check mark, okay, did you get that lesson done? And essentially the kids hate it. The teachers hate it, whether or not they even do it. You're not sure unless you go around and check to make sure they're doing that program that we purchased because it has zero relevance to the kid. Um, so we talk a lot about teaching all of these skills that are so important. And I think we have the academics down pat in schools. But when you take something that is authentic and relevant to a kid, and let me point out that 97% of teenagers, 12 to 17, they're playing video games. Somehow, can't we take that and wrap our arms around it and lean in and apply that to some actual learning? That is when we talk about all the time in schools, authentic and relevant learning. This is authentic and relevant to kids. So social emotional learning, and I just really kind of gave an example of one of our gaming concepts, you know, the key to how do we, how do we manage our anger? Well, we can talk about that in a group setting and mark it off on our little boxes. But if we say, guys, you know, we're going to be playing some games in here. You know, how many of you have like gotten really angry, even if you're playing card games or something, you know, it doesn't matter if you're on, you know, you're, you're playing games at home. All of you guys play video games, right? What's your favorite? You know, have you seen people, have you seen people be mean to others? Have you seen kind of a toxic environment instead of saying, how many of you in here have been bullied? <laughs> you know, they're going to like, I don't know. I mean, the, the word bullying is so overused in this day and age, you know, but how many of you have seen some toxic behavior when you guys are playing video games, you know, and how does that made you feel? Um, did it cause you to stop playing some of your favorite video games? Now you're talking about cyberbullying and things like that. Have you ever been the person to do it to somebody else? Oh, they'll tell you about all kinds of stories. So now we're making it purposeful and relevant. So then how do we combat that in this class so that you know, when we are playing games and we know anger is going to happen, because guys, I want you to understand anger is a normal emotion. It is not something that you 
can get away from. You're going to feel angry. But what do we do to react to that? Because all we can control is our reaction. Right now, what are your reactions? Do you, some of you probably cry. Some of you probably hit people. Some of you probably break equipment. None of which are, you know, great. Um, so how can we learn to manage that emotion? Because you're normal to have it. And then the hope is then that they take that out to other places in their life because now they understand the why behind I'm getting angry, even if I'm just playing a game and someone said something to me. That triggers something in them, right? It's just that much more relevant. And that social emotional piece becomes something that they can then really cling to. And it's a great conversation because you're actually getting them to talk. They won't talk about bullying or whether or not they've been one or, or had it done to them. Nobody wants to talk about that. But reframe it in a way that um, it, it it's something they're doing every day and they're seeing it every day. Just makes more sense to me. Entirely. And the idea of recognizing that this is something that so many young folks are already passionate about. And so we have like this perfect vehicle for these conversations that have that relevance. You know, rather, I, I think, you know, Kids and children are very savvy. As you said, they know when this is like a tick box, you know, having to have this conversation versus this is really about you, right? And you're taking note of the things that you care about and are passionate with and are sort of, you know, um, this is actually like a real life scenario, not an artificial one. That's right. really, Really great advice. And, and I love your idea of you know, just asking them, like, what are the games that you're playing and why do you yes. enjoy them? There's a great stat out there about how also like board games are more yes. popular today than they were like 50 years ago. Um, Chess is making a comeback. So, I mean, the, it, it's all, you know, and, and don't tell me as an adult, you're not a gamer. I know. I see you playing Wordle. I see you playing Solitaire. We are all gamers to some capacity. I always say I'm not a gamer today, but I was. I was the OG, you know, of Miss Pac-Man. I know my pattern still. I may not know what I did yesterday, but I can beat you at Miss Pac-Man still. Um, you know, everybody has this time and place, but they don't go on to be gamers for the rest of their lives. And that negative, there's such a negative connotation around gamers, which is the other thing that frustrates me is because I see it in the schools and I see I'm constantly trying to educate principals and superintendents that, no, you need to you need to lean in and relearn about what you think, you know, because you probably, I'm going to debunk all your myths. You know, um, it's, it's something that I think is so necessary in schools to get them back and get them engaged. Because I think if we learned anything after the pandemic and after COVID, we got to make school relevant and, and get those kids back to where they feel like they're a part of that building. And we all have about 10 to 20% of the kids that we just can't reach. I guarantee you will reach them with gaming. I love that. It's a powerful statement. And, you know, what you're talking about in terms of checking our assumptions, I also think young folks are looking to us to model that intellectual humility and that flexibility. So if you're hearing this and you are just really doubtful, actually take some time to invest in looking at the research. You know, in the summer, we were very happy to have Dr. Rachel Cowart on, who's got great books that are uh, for the parent caretaker audience. And she's doing a lot of education out there of like, here's actually what the research says. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, So it it could be great to do like a little lit review and also a little experimentation yourself because you know what you're saying about, yes, Wordle counts. And even if you have not played a game in a very long time, try it out and actually try it out with some of the young folks in your life. You know, I I think we preach a lot about lifelong learning. Where are we showing that we're also willing to try new things, right? It matters. Absolutely. And one of my favorite stories too is about, you know, we're, we're, we're pushing a lot of shame onto kids and I did it. I was guilty of it. I was a mom, you know, who, um, my son would be playing his games in in the basement. I remember having a discussion going, he's going to be a loser. I I said that. And there's so many more worse things they could be doing. But the reality is it's because we have this misconception around it or perception around it because it's not normalized in school. If a kid was playing basketball for six hours, shooting hoops or practicing their flute for six hours or reading for six hours, we're like, oh, that's just fine because it's in schools. Well, we haven't normalized esports in schools. And so that's this is their connection. And people think it's a loss of connection. I beg to differ 100 percent. This is their connection. 
And if you want to connect them to other peers in the building and you want to connect them to the school so that they feel a part of this school, and that just completely helps everything about them, which really, ex- it, it's good for your culture. I, I just can't stress the importance of it enough. Like if you're if you're not doing it, I think you're late to the ball game. I mean, it's the ones that are doing it are seeing results like no other. Um, and it's we have the data to back that up. And so it's really exciting. Um, I love the work that I get to do because I'm still benef- I'm still impacting kids every single day. Well, again, your your passion and your conviction just really come through. So I, I think you definitely are provoking a few listeners to uh, learn more. And one way they can do that is actually, again, uh, the, the blog that I pointed out earlier, we're going to keep yeah. these links in the show notes. Um, and you wrote another blog post about how esports can help marginalized populations in school with mm-hmm. their SEL and mental health. Specifically, you shared findings about gaming as a positive pathway for LGBTQ plus students. Again, I'm going to make sure that that mm-hmm. link is over there. It's a great post. It offers really positive findings that the implementation of a program can have a really quick and efficient outcome too. We're not talking about implementing a program waiting a decade. Um, you know, you kind of, you point out how the, the turnaround can be quite rapid can you say more about the transformation that you've seen in schools when a school mm-hmm. invests in esports? Sure, absolutely. Um, so we actually um, have um, a study that was done with our gaming concepts, with implementing gaming concepts. And what's really great about it is that within each of our um, our books, our courses, our resources, um, they have mental health moments embedded, which is what I talked about earlier that's more authentic and, and around that learning. And what we did was we had um, about 500 students, six through 12. And from that, um, half of the group didn't have the mental health moments, but they still had gaming concepts. And then the other half um, did have the mental health moments. The ones that didn't have it showed zero growth, like nothing. Um, The ones that did have it, so this is purposeful and intentional um, moments where they can really dig into that social emotional piece, um, showed tremendous gains in percentages. And I want to point out that that was over the course of a semester. So there were three touch points, um, 10 weeks total. And for example, you know, the, you bring up the LGBTQ students, which I talk about, you know, they grew in their percentages of self-esteem because we use the Rosenberg scale of self-esteem. They went up in their self-esteem by 38% in 10 weeks, which is unheard of. Um, you know, I think as we try to help, um, different populations, so, you know, we're trying to include marginalized populations, students that are more at risk, you know, the CDC said that was students of color, females and LGBTQ females, I mean, suicide ideation went up 51% in, in 2021. Um, we were helping them come from abnormally low ranges of self-esteem to normal ranges of self-esteem. So when you do that, you're pulling them out of those at-risk behaviors and you're creating that community. I mean, there's even research to say that if you have one friend, just one friend, it can really pull you out of that at-risk. So maybe they find that one friend when they're taking the gaming concepts class, when they've you know incorporated that into their learning somehow, or they joined an esports team. My feeling is, is if you're not doing it, isn't that negligent on our part? If we know that there's something that has a that big of a, you know, a help to students, why would we not? If we're in education for kids, and I know that's what I did, I'm going to try anything, even if I don't know anything about it, and I'm going to learn everything I can about it so I can better understand it. And so instead of creating shame around video games and esports, because that's essentially what the media has created, Figure out how it can really benefit your students. And we have we have data to show it's improving attendance. In one alternative high school, it went up by 10%. That's bringing in more funding for you, for your schools. You know, um, attendance is a huge problem in schools. So if you can help with attendance grades and self-esteem for a large portion of kids that you just can't feel like you're reaching, why would you not? I can't think of a reason why you wouldn't, other than I just don't want to deal with it. And, you know, again, I appreciate you sharing those numbers and those statistics. And I think it's so important for us to think like uh, at a human level, like these oh. are human beings, you know, you've got students who maybe are on that path to graduate who would not have been, who, as you yeah. said, the impact of just having one friend 
Like that's yeah. transformative. Transformative. And I might add, uh, you know, when you're thinking about an inclusive environment, you know, there's no gender in esports. Um, there you can be uh, you can have one arm and still be involved in esports because there's going to be some type of um, uh, you know device that can adapt to them. We have kids that are becoming champions, and they're on the on the autism spectrum. You know, so you get neurodivergent kids, you get special uh, needs kids, you get um, students that don't feel like they belong anywhere else. And you put them all together and it's magic. I mean, it's just magic. Um, and I, I just, it, I, we hear story after story, day after day after day after day. Um, and specifically with our gaming concepts and how that is impacting kids at just such an amazing level. These are leaders of tomorrow. I don't care what you say. This is no different than a band class. Um, they're not going to go and be a professional trombone player, but they're going to take those skills that are super transferable and they're going to go change the world. Um, that's who we're dealing with. These are smart kids. They want to be connected and involved and they want leadership roles. You will see kids flourish that you never saw flourish before. And they might've been on your at-risk list. I don't even know, but that's what we continue to hear and see. And it just, it just fills my cup, fills my cup. That's beautiful. And, you know, we had the CEO of Women in Games International um, talking about uh, on the show over the summer, talking about all of the different avenues in the gaming industry. So I think also it's, these are leadership skills that also have so many different directions to go in. So I think that's really important to remember too, is like, you know, you're setting your, your students up on a trajectory to explore an industry that's faster growing than Hollywood, faster growing than the music industry. Like, you know, I continue to think about just how mm. big that is. Um, well, Two stats for you. It's about a $225 billion industry by 2025. And it's watched by the number of viewers just under who watches the NFL. So we are beating out all of the professional sports as far as viewership, even. This is what you know they're involved in. This aligns with everything we're doing in schools with, with career and tech ed, um, the audiovisual pathways. That's where all of our gaming concepts takes place, is within those, because again. Not everybody's going to be a video game designer. So we have really opened up just a, a world of um, places that they could go and get careers in um, within the industry or in other industries where they have this particular, um, you know, niche, 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 niche. There it is. Yeah. Well, yeah. And that's, I mean, Joni had pointed out to us that there are chiropractors who specify in gaming and it just, you know, kind of blew yes. my mind in terms of like all the different, and she was like accounting, there's accounting, uh, you know, folks who are specifically looking at it for this industry. Lawy so, lawyers, lawyers. lawyers um, yeah. Yeah. Mental so. health, all of that stuff. Yeah. We've got to, and just like our athletes in school or people who are in activities, we're always helping them to like you know, not become addicted to things to take care of their personal wellness. This is the same with these kids. You know, we got to teach them about addiction and we got to teach them about um, their nutrition. You can't just drink a monster energy and eat chips all night and play video games. That's not good for you. You have to sleep. So that's, let's use that to our advantage to create really wonderful, well-adjusted adults that are successful. Okay. So Dr. Kraft, I know that there are going to be folks who have heard you, they're feeling fired up, you know, they would <laughs> love to explore a little bit more about this. And you mentioned, you know, what is holding you back? I am going to imagine for some folks they are thinking, well, what's holding me back is I don't know where to get started. And, you know, again, I am pointing folks to your blog, but of course the website also has a lot of PD mm -hmm. opportunities for educators. Do you want to talk yeah. a little bit more yeah. about um, how that could help as a, a starting point for somebody who's like, I want to start, but Dr. Kraft, where do I but, go to start? Correct. Yeah. Uh, I think, first of all, um, important to note that starting is not as hard as they think it is. I think they think they have to have all this technology and it's just overwhelming and it's going to be expensive. And that is just not the case. So the first place to start is to, I think, reach out to us. You know, we are all educators. I think that gives us um, some real credibility. We know where you've been. We've been in your shoes. So they can reach out on gamingconcepts.gg. 
which like you said, has a ton of um, information, blogs, webinars, you name it. Um, you can easily get in touch um, with one of our um, associates, which all of us, again, we've been in education. So there's about five of us across the country right now. And and then just um, you know, lean in and listen to um, what we'll share with you. And we want to know what your needs are. Like we want to know what your challenges are. And I guarantee your challenges revolve around attendance, grades, student engagement, um, and mental health. Um, and we have a solution for all of that. So it doesn't have to start with a ton of money. You can go anywhere from it starts for nothing free all the way to, okay, we're going to make this a part. The, the really successful ones have made it a part of their school and their district, and it's normalized. It is, it is no different than anything else that is in the school. It is normalized within their school. It is celebrated within their school. And that's what you want to work up to because Kids who have the ability to play in the band or be in the theater program, or maybe they, you know, play volleyball or anything like that, they have that place to go. And eventually that's what you want to have. You want to have the creme de la creme. You want to have the esports lab uh, to create that team environment. Um, but that's not where it begins. It's a very simple start. It's very cost effective. Um, we spend so much money on, I spent $5,000 on a mental health speaker that came for one day. What did that do? You know, we're guilty of these things. Um, and so when you have something that works for, I always say, it's like, you know, look at what we spend on a football program. Look at what we spend on, you know, uh, instruments for band. It's astronomical. This is not, it is not at all. Um, and there's so many grants right now too, when it comes to STEM or CTE or things like that. So we really want to normalize it. We want to make it academic and giving it a learning focus. And when you do that, you open up funding that you don't think you have because people don't want you to ask for money. So kids can play video games. They want you to ask for money. So kids can learn about successful post-secondary careers so that they can improve in their attendance, improve in their grades, improve in their self-esteem. They can even get scholarships. 25 million scholarships are out there to be just handed out to kids and five to 8 million never gets used because we don't have enough kids playing esports. This is a absolute ticket to college if they want that. Yeah, it's incredible. I feel like even, you know, do a Google search of the gaming oh. adjacent um, master's degrees, graduate programs, undergrad degrees. We yeah. spoke to a professor who teaches about uh, gaming and anthropology. They study the community of folks, you know, the millions of people that play World of Warcraft. Yes. Um, you know, again, there's just, there's so many different opportunities, I think, than the average person is aware of. You know, Dr. Kraft, final question. As you're yeah. speaking, though, I'm, I'm really kind of grappling with how your involvement with this it says something, I think, about the changing nature of the school leader that today's world mm -hmm. needs. You know, everything that you had to say about <laughs> really focusing on community, on belonging, on being aware of the mental health crisis that we are in, um, mm -hmm. and also your willingness to say, let's try something different. Like, I feel like these are all mindsets that are so necessary. And it's easy to say, of course harder to implement. Like I'm willing to yeah. bet that, you know, when you tell folks that not only are you an award-winning school leader, but you're also an advocate for esports and gaming that some eyebrows are perhaps raised. But I'm wondering how your involvement with gaming has also shaped your kind of vision for what it actually means to lead a school. Yes. And I think that's a that's a really great question that you pose. And you know, I think we need school leaders who are willing to think outside the box, who are willing to be the champion for kid, even if it means you're going to get pushback. You're going to get pushback, most likely on something with esports. So how are you prepared to combat the pushback? We know as leaders in education, especially if you're like at the high school level, you are a target. And so you have to be willing to push past um, what people say is not going to work or is wrong to have, you've got to be willing to push past it because when you push past, you are making a tremendous difference in the lives of kids. And the bottom line is, is it's not about you. It's not about me. It's not about anybody, but the kid. And so if it is something that is going to work and I, and it does, it just does. 
you you have to you have to be willing as a leader to 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 combat what's coming your way. And we get a lot coming our way right now. Um, but I feel like this is such a good solution that would actually transcend your leadership and it would really create this amazing culture in your building where all your kids feel really welcome and a part of that place. And that's, I don't know that I've ever seen that anywhere, but when you add something like this, you're getting that, you're getting it so much closer to that goal. When you're not, you're, you're, you're completely turning a blind eye to those kids. And that's not who we are as educational leaders. And it's not who we should be. So quit discounting or shaming um, or looking the other way because they need you to see them. They need you to see them and fight for them. That's, I can't think of a better note to end on. Thank you so much for lending your expertise, your passion. And again, I think your, you know, reminder of, you're right. It's not about us. It is about the kids. So thank you so much, Dr. Kraft, for, for coming on the show and sharing with us. Uh, folks will be able to learn more about you over there in the show notes. Oh, thank you so much for having me. It was a joy to talk to you today. We hope you enjoyed this conversation and we'd like to invite you to make a contribution to our podcast communities conversation about it. When you head over to camp.shiftingschools.com, again, that link is over there in the show notes, you can join a community of listeners where we are inviting you to deliver your feedback for you to really respond to some of the key questions here and one of those questions that we are thinking about after this conversation is as we hope to deliver and cultivate SEL for our young learners there are some skills that we as school leaders as educators need to be working on for ourselves what do you think is one of the most important ones that we need to work on in order to lead for SEL. If you've got thoughts about that question or anything to do with this week's episode, please head over to camp.shiftingschools.com and weigh in. See you again next week.